Known simply as the Egyptian pyramids, these giant masonry structures are scattered throughout Egypt, with 118 of them still standing, and a presumed hundred more to have ever been built. The oldest and coincidentally largest of these pyramids, the Great Pyramid of Giza, which has survived for over 4,000 years. The idea of constructing a 450-footed structure out of limestone seems near impossible, and we're in the 21st century. Then, the question is, how did they do it in ancient Egypt? All cards on deck, from elaborate technology well ahead of its time, to help from galaxies far and wide, people have come up with all sorts of theories to explain the pyramid's construction. For example, Elon Musk shocked everyone when he tweeted that there was nothing mysterious about pyramids and that there is a perfectly logical explanation of how pyramids were built. And in his tweet, Elon provided a link to an article that details one theory about how pyramids were built. However, with the help of modern technologies, new discoveries that scientists had made finally reveals the answers to this mysterious phenomenon. How pyramids were built? What was the genius system that Egyptians invented and used that made all of these possible? These are the shocking findings by researchers that will blow your mind. So let's start. You can choose any movie based on ancient Egypt, and you'll indefinitely find a scene wherein a tyrant pharaoh is yelling at slaves to work harder, faster, or overall just better on his pyramid. The scene is pretty stereotypical, a tyrant exacting unbearable workload from a slave force, who, in turn, have no choice to comply. Because, well, they're cursed to a life of serving the pharaoh, or whomsoever their master might be, without question. It might seem more plausible, and perhaps also comforting to some people, that the 400-footed structure was constructed over a period of 40 years by people who were doing so against their will. However, recent evidence suggests that there was actually a dedicated workforce designated for the construction of the pyramids. Researchers uncovered several pieces of crucial evidence that suggested a dedicated workforce was employed for the construction of the pyramids. Their theory was backed by findings, such as ancient cities, burial grounds at the foot of the pyramids, as well as animal carcasses, suggesting that the workforce was fed like royals. Even if the construction involved a slave force, the entire project could not go underway without some engineer-ish intervention. Basically, someone had to tell them how to do it for them to actually do it. As of now, there's more evidence to suggest that the pyramids were built by a dedicated workforce who were in turn treated like royals for their service. This is supported notably by the fact that burial grounds were found at the foot of the pyramids, suggesting that whoever died while constructing the masonry was treated with honor. As scientists revealed, building the pyramids was a three-step process. Step one, choosing the building site. For building pyramids, you need to have the perfect building site. After all, pyramids were long intended to serve as the final burial ground of pharaohs, and they wouldn't settle for anything less than the best. The best, therefore, starts from choosing the site itself. Besides technical considerations, plateau, river rises, and climactic considerations, workers had to keep in mind other factors too. Where does the sun rise and set? How far is it from the pharaoh's palace? And would the site influence the pharaoh's eventual rise from the dead? All quite important points to be kept in mind. The building site for every pyramid was in close proximity to the Nile, and even more interestingly, they were all built towards the west of the Nile. Why? Because ancient Egyptians believed that if a burial site is situated where the sun sets, that is the west, there would be a heightened chance of them returning in the afterlife. Next, the rise of the river had to be considered. The pyramid was made largely of limestone that could wash away with rising tides. The inundation of the river had to be kept in mind. Lastly, the pyramids were built to pay homage to the presiding pharaoh, and the pharaoh would routinely visit the site. The site would therefore have to be located near the palace, but not too near. The next step was to prepare the site. While the ancient pyramids of Egypt are, well, ancient, they are the only of the seven wonders of the world to have survived all these years. Interestingly enough, they are also the oldest contenders on that list. The workforce behind them deserve all the praise. Had they begun construction on loose sand, we wouldn't have one of the world's tallest standing and well-known sites. The workers would start construction by building a foundation. They would remove loose sand from the ground, flatten the surface, and then lay down a limestone foundation. Another interesting tidbit about the Egyptians is that while the compass was invented several thousands of years later, the ancient Egyptians had formulated their own method of discovering true north and true south. The workforce started off construction by noting a star's position in the northern hemisphere. 
They would then follow the star's path until a bisected path could be determined to find true south. Using right angles, the workers would then determine east and west. Preparing the site probably took up a considerable amount of time. After all, it was the foundation of the entire structure and was supposed to withstand over 2 million limestone blocks on top of it. The final step was about raising blocks atop one another. Last, but in no way, shape or form the least, the workers had to devise a method to raise blocks atop of one another. The pyramids, as we see them today, have blocks that lie on top of one another at a specific angle. These blocks, however, are all over 20 feet tall. How then did the workers, at a time where cranes were a fantasy, find a way to raise them on top of each other? Current evidence supports two theories, the ramp theory and the water shaft theory. The ramp theory is generally backed by more significant evidence, but the water shaft theory makes just as much sense. If we consider the ramp theory, at Hatnub, an Anglo-French team found evidence of a ramp-like mechanism which might suggest that the limestone blocks were raised using ramps. The idea that ancient Egyptians used ramps was discussed way long before the ultimate discovery, but was always disregarded. Why? Because for a ramp to have raised over a million limestone blocks, it would have to be quite sturdy and also quite steep, at an angle of 20 degrees. We need to give the workforce that managed to construct the Great Pyramids of Giza more credit. The team discovered steep ramps with staircases running alongside them. These staircases were marked with holes at random intervals between them, probably marking a pulley system to bring up water. Why was water necessary? Because the workforce used a combination of wet sand to bring the limestone blocks from the area they were carved at to the site of the pyramid. Dragging a huge, hefty block of limestone would take up a lot of manpower, and the pyramids would have to be delayed by another 40 years. Again, we need to give the workforce more credit. However, the water shaft theory disregards the ramp theory entirely. It instead focuses on a system of canals interlinked with one another and a series of moats that could be used, controlled by another series of gates to bring the limestone blocks upwards, an idea seemingly far too complicated for ancient Egypt. But hey, we're talking about the masons who built something that survived the test of time for 4,000 years. Blocks were transported from the build site to the pyramid site using floats made out of cedarwood or inflated animal skins wrapped in papyrus. These floats would be attached to stones and then pulled from the shore. A series of canals were constructed to then take the blocks upwards. The canals led to a moat that then went all the way around the build site. Pipelines, four of them actually, were then constructed that would float the blocks upwards. These canals were extended as the pyramid grew. They were controlled by a series of gates that determined just how much the blocks would move from the moat to the top of the pyramid. A pool of water was available at the top to allow for further floating and positioning without any glitches. While seemingly complicated, the water shaft theory does provide an easier way for limestone blocks to be carried and raised on top of each other. The theory is supported by irregular structures found on all four sides of the structures, plus traces of water systems. That's it. Don't forget to subscribe.